we're on to Matthew 6. And um, Dan, I think, was the last person who, who had an outing on this one. And now you've got me for two weeks. As Dan is sunning himself, hopefully, in Devon. So um, we are looking particularly at verse 19 onwards. Now, um, today is all about building treasures in heaven and what it means to build treasures in heaven. I think I've said this kind of thing a number of times. For me, coming out of a, a completely unchurched family and then um, meeting Jesus in, in a small brethren chapel in Horn Church uh, and having this sort of epiphany of, wow, life isn't what I thought it was, um, that, that had not just a major salvation impact, I think it has a really cultural impact on you when you don't grow up in a Christian home. Because you, when I pray that we see more and more people growing up in Christian homes, um, you're most, most likely to come to faith, actually, if you're raised in a Christian home. Um, and I think the more people who are growing up in Christian homes means more people have come to Christ. But when, when I came to Christ, it was from a completely unchurched background. It has a cultural impact as well as a spiritual impact. And amongst many things that happened to me on that day, one of the things I realized profoundly was that this life is not it. Now, that doesn't sound very profound, but actually it is. This, this isn't it. Most people live their lives like, this is it. There is a, 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 a film, I think it was War of the Roses, might have been that, with Danny DeVito in it. I think it was that film, and he said, he did this brilliant monologue, and he said, essentially, life is a game, and he who dies with the most toys wins. It's meant to be a comedy line, but actually it's quite tragic. If that, if that in your final analysis is life, accumulate as many toys as possible and then snuff it, that's actually a bit of a sick joke. But I don't think that most people really believe that. So me and Karen are having dinner with some friends only recently. And we've known them a couple of years, and um, we, we try and gently introduce philosophical things about life. And, and we finally, it's taken me two years, what a rubbish evangelist. I'm like a rampant evangelist for a living. And uh, it's taken me ages to get to this conversation. We finally got an acknowledgement that maybe this life isn't it. That maybe there's something else. One person around the table said, well, I think it's a reincarnation. So I sort of gently teased out how do you, be, how you, do you become a good ant to come back as something else. What happens to all these ants and cockroaches and trees? Or what if you came back as a tree? How boring would that be? Anyway, we didn't go too far into it, but it was the acknowledgement that this life can't be it, which I thought was a major leap forward. And, and another person said, well, I think when you die, you're surrounded by all your mates and your family and like all the people you loved. And I felt like saying, but what about the people that other people loved that you don't love? Where are they? Or do you get segregated from them by a big wall? like a Trump-esque wall, like just separating you from people you don't like. You know, I thought it just doesn't work. It's all a bit weird, but it was an acknowledgement that there is more to life, that this can't be it. And when you meet Jesus, that is a profound realization that everything around us will pass away um, and, and, and there is a destiny to come. And, and Jesus is very clear within that how we are to live. And it starts at verse 19, after the, the stuff about prayer we looked at. Do, Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Very profound, that. The eye is the lamp of the body, said Jesus. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If 
If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And he finishes off by saying this, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus was such a like, straight-talking guy. And that's really profound stuff. Um, Q Branch, can you put up that picture for me uh, that I gave you? Yes. This, oh, this is amazing. This is the Bahama Resort in the Bahamas. And no, I haven't been there yet. No, I'm, 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 for the purposes of research on this sermon, I may have to pay a little visit on expenses. Um, this result, I made some notes on it. I really have so many notes as this, but I, I've had loads of facts and stats down. So, this resort has 2,300 plus rooms, most of them at executive level. It has a Jack Nicholas designed signature 18 hole golf course. It has dozens of, of, of dining halls and restaurants, uh, several of which they're hoping to be Michelin star. And it has dozens of shops that specialize in Cartier, Rolex, and Tiffany, etc. And the whole resort so far has cost 2.4 billion pounds. Pounds. Not dollars. Pounds. 2.4 billion. And it's empty. It sits on the Bahamas empty because the Swiss billionaire financier got the hump with some of the bankers and some of the landowners and decided not to let anyone in it. So now it sits 2.4 billion pounds worth of luxury hotel decaying on the Bahamas. It's such a catastrophe for the Bahamas, they reckon within a year, if this thing maintains itself like this, the whole of the Bahamas is going to go catastrophically bankrupt and, sp and spiral into poverty over a luxury hotel that sits empty. And I read about that on the news and I thought to myself, well, well, that's, that's a parallel. A life pursued for the wrong things, a life pursued without God is in danger of sending you into bankruptcy, actually. That was such a stark and graphic realization. Look at that, all those rooms sending the Bahamas completely bankrupt. So Jesus tells us not to focus on storing up treasures on earth, but to build a heavenly treasure chest. So I thought for today, I would go through a few bullet points as to what I, what I managed to squeeze out of the Bible was the sort of thing that would build heavenly treasure. And then I'm going to look at what will empty your heavenly treasure chest uh, in contrast just for 15 minutes or so. Now, I'm not talking about, like, if, if, if it was all about sins, we, we'd have an endless list of sins that would stop you building up treasure in heaven. It's not that. I'm thinking more about characteristics today. And it's just a few points. If you make notes, you can you could jot these down. We're going to send out home group questions. Hopefully, if Karen uh, is, is, uh, harasses me enough to write them, because I always forget, because I have this other thing going on. So... Uh, good work, <laughs> getting away. Right, number one, trust God. That doesn't sound very profound, does it? But building up treasures in heaven, number one, trust God. Uh, Hebrews 11.6, I think is a beautiful passage. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, it says. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who 
diligently seek him. Now, check this out. Where that says that in Hebrews 11, 6, he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. It then lists a load of examples of people who had faith who pleased God. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah pleased God, built treasure in heaven, because he trusted God with a word from God, even about things he hadn't yet seen, built an ark in the desert kind of stuff. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was yet to rec- which he was to receive from inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. I kind of like that. That's an adventurous model of faith, isn't it? God speaks, and I'm going to go. It's like you can imagine. I don't know how the conversation went, but somewhere in in his heart, it'd be like, Abraham, yes, Lord. I want you to head off. Whereabouts? I'm not going to tell you. What have I got to do? Pack up. Well, where am I going? Bowls over? Uh, north or south? Well, just go. And I'll show you the land. And he packs everything up, all his herds and his people and his servants, and he just heads off. I love that. It's a different model of faith. I always contrast for me the, the models of faith between Moses and Joshua. When Moses gets to the seas, he puts his, he puts his staff in it and the, and, the, and the seas part but he doesn't actually move into the water until the seas part. When Joshua crossed the floodplains of the Jordan, God told him to put his feet in the floodplains first and trust that the waters would part. It's a different model of faith. And it seems to me that when we adopt that kind of, I will pioneer my faith, I will step out for God, it really pleases him. Now, that means you need to be careful. You know what God is actually saying to you. You know, if you've had some strong Edam, the night before and you have a weird God dream, you might be that you dreamt that God has spoken to you rather than God spoke to you in a dream. So you've got to check it out. But when it's checked out and you believe that God's speaking to you, to exercise faith blesses the Lord. It's very clear in the Bible. And I I think I might have told you about, or some of you about this before, but it it was an amazing uh, time for me. So I'm just going to share this again. That we, we, when I was leading the last ministry I was at before the message, we really believe that God had given us quite a, a clear strategy for the way forward and we're all in agreement as a board of directors and a senior team in agreement and we covenanted over it and we prayed and we fasted and we had confirming words from people and we saw it coming from scripture and we had prophecies about what we were going to do and it was, it was going to take a major step of faith. So we, we entered into this new sphere of doing the ministry that we were doing. It was basically a cottage industry we were involved in. We had a global vision for, but we didn't have global funds or resources or global type people. It was just a vision that we were pursuing. And we started to move towards it. But within six months, we had completely run out of money. And I remember going to speak at a conference and we needed, we needed 10 grand by the Monday or we were going to go under. I'm sure I've told you about this before. Have I told you about this before? I've told some of you about it before. Some of you are nodding, some of you are shaking. Bear with me. It's like looking at a beautiful picture on your wall. Can't get enough of it, can you? It's a beautiful story. I'll tell you a beautiful story about what the Lord did. So uh, I turn up at a conference, going to cut a lot of the detail out. I speak at a conference in London, uh, thinking I'm going to have to wind up the ministry on Monday. I'm going to have to lay everyone off, just over 10 grand. I'm going to have to shut everything down. And this guy comes up to me and he says, I, I, was, I got here late, but I was sitting on the underground and, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want to share a prophecy from the front, if that's all right. I said, well, what, what, there are about a thousand guys there, you know, so it's a bit sensitive. thought, I don't want anything lunatic happening from the stage. So I said, what is it? And he went, the Lord's told me that someone has got to give a gift of 10,000 pounds to someone else. Now, that's very tempting at that moment to say, that's me. <laughs> that's, that's me. But I didn't. I thought, oh, just got to <laughs> just bit my lip. And... Um, he walked away, and I went, okay, look, let me just let me dwell on it, and uh, that's quite a big prophecy, you know, it's quite a big thing. Don't want to sound manipulative, so just let me think on it for a bit. And he walked away, he, and, he, and then he turned around, and he went, <gasps> he said, it's me who's got to give the £10,000. He went, wow. And he said, I've got to give it to you. Do you need £10,000? Now, I could have said, yeah, me personally, because I've always wanted a Porsche Boxster, but I didn't. See, the ministry I'm involved in needs 10,000 pounds. It was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. 
We had stepped out for God and God provided the money. Apart from on the Monday, he phoned up at 8 o'clock. I was walking, flick, over the woods, and he phoned up and he said, look, about that £10,000. I said, what is it? He said, oh, the money was, was pledged to a trust fund. I didn't talk to my business partner about it. It's pledged through a trust fund to build a hospital in Africa. I went, oh, hmm, okay. You know, thought I'd better get back on the old redundancy trail then. Uh, make the staff redundant kind of thing, or declare ourselves insolvent. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, the weirdest thing was, when I got back from this conference and I told my business partner I should have spoken to you first. And he said, but then on a Sunday, he said, uh, someone got in touch with us and said, the Lord's told me that your trust fund needs an additional 10,000 pounds. He said, so we're going we're gonna to wire it across on Monday. He said, so you're getting the 10,000 pounds and the hospital's still getting the 10,000 pounds. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You know, isn't that amazing? I went, that's really amazing. That's amazing. That dog walk that day felt amazing. But you trust the Lord and you step into the waters. I believe that he builds treasures in heaven. When you step out for the right things, it pleases God. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Next thing, love the poor. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they've done. And you know the passages from Isaiah 58, I'm sure, about true fasting. When you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, when you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, etc., etc., etc. If we had more time, I'd read you through Isaiah 58 and we'd pause on it and we'd dwell on it. God's heart for the poor. This is the kind of fasting I want to break the chains of injustice, to care for the orphan and the widow. So he goes on to say, that's true fast, that's my heart, says the Lord. But he says, if you do this, if you do this, then your healing will quickly appear. You'll call for help and I'll answer you. This is in Isaiah 58. If you take out passages in the Bible about blessing and loving the poor, you actually have quite a thin Bible. I think God loves it. I think you can't outgive him on that one. I think when we spend ourselves on behalf of the needy and the oppressed, God absolutely loves it. It's so clear as well in the New Testament. You look at passages like Acts 2 and people showing possessions and Acts 5 and no one was without because everyone was giving as, they, as there was a need and they addressed it. So, for instance, we're going to be doing our compassion project coming up probably around September, October, where as a church we want to get behind a whole village or uh, an area and sponsor as many kids as possible to get as many projects going as possible to alleviate poverty in a particular area. And some of you may already be sponsoring a compassion child. Well, Karen and I have got a couple going. In fact, we've got another one through work. It's three all together that we're sponsoring. I'm not saying that to big it up. I just think you've got to do more. Do more. God, I don't, I don't want to kneel in front of Jesus one day. And he says, you know, well, welcome, welcome in. And there's a little look. You could have done a bit more with what I gave you. You could have done a bit more. Someone mentioned to me that the, the Schindler's List film. I think it was last week. Someone took me aside and said, I saw that film, Schindler's List, where he, where he rescued the Jews from the concentration camp. And at the end, he breaks down and he says, if I could have done more, I could have done more. I could have saved another one. And I do, I, I do feel as a church, we've got to, have our, to pray that God breaks our heart for this. Do you know uh, where I work, we... we, we Right at the start of that ministry, at the message, they decided to set aside at least 10% of everything that comes in to give to the poor and to needy causes. And as the income's grown, they've never shied away from it. So on an average month, we're giving away over £50,000 a month now to the poor. And every member of staff who works there and passes probation has a compassion kid sponsored in their name at the cost of the ministry, or they can pay it if they want to. Because we want to be a ministry in a place that blesses the poor. That'd be a great vision for this church, wouldn't it? To really be doing something amazing and actually maybe doing more than the, the 10%. Number three, be generous, linking it to that. Uh, I, Corinthians 9 7, 2 Corinthians 9 7 is very clear about giving. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 is very clear about setting aside a, a sum in keeping of your income. Luke 6, 38, giving it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. 
But I don't just think it's about financial giving. I think as a church, you need to increasingly understand what it means to be generous. I think this pleases God. I think it builds your treasure in heaven. I think it means opening your homes to each other. Or to people that you might not instinctively get on with. Spending time with people who aren't like you is a great kingdom principle, I think. Learning what it means to really open your homes and really open your lives and really sort of give away sacrificially. I do, I just, I just have this feeling. I, I, I look at my life and I look at my prayers and the things that I'm concerned about. And sometimes in my more sort of enlightened moments, I just feel a bit selfish. If I'm honest, hey, like I've said this before, but the things I pray for, like I, I pray about my kids and my wife. Like I, I'm praying that the, the kids have multi-millionaire husbands. How selfish is that? No, I'm not. <laughs> I pray that they find husbands who love the Lord, but I've been praying that since they were tiny. But it's like, it feels like, I know that's a good thing, but I think I wish I spent more time praying about people who don't know Jesus around the world or the poor or the way I use my time. Sometimes I get in, I think, I just want to put my feet up and watch a bit of telly, have a cup of tea. And sometimes I'm just, I'm honest, just a bit lazy. So I feel a bit selfish. Or, like, we could have people over for dinner and then I, I might, like, I'm tempted to invent some fabrication in my diary so I don't have to see anyone because I'm tired. I don't have fake diary entries, but do you know what I mean? I think, oh, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. But then when you do, it's a real blessing because I think it pleases the Lord. And the more you give, the more he gives back. So I think really trying to understand generosity is a beautiful thing. Number four, just, uh, just four brief points, and I've got some summaries and then uh, how to empty your heavenly bank account. Share your faith. Matthew 28 tells us to go, doesn't it? So our standing orders have never been revoked. I know we're not all rampant evangelists, but we can all share our faith in some way. We can all do our bit to witness for the Lord. And I believe that when we do that, the promise is that he'll be with us, according to Matthew 28. He's with us when we do that. I, I, I have to say that I've never experienced such rapid answers to prayer as when I pray that I'm given an opportunity to share my faith. You know, a lot of people say, or some people say, I've never had God answer a prayer. Pray that you have an opportunity to share your faith, and I guarantee you that prayer will be answered really quickly. Absolutely guarantee it, and I believe the Lord loves it. Uh, some summary points on this. Uh, I think God loves it when people get saved and when we work towards that. I think he loves it when the poor are blessed. I think he loves generosity. He loves kindness. He loves joy. He loves sacrifice. He blesses peacemakers, the meek. He blesses honesty, truth. He likes people who keep a repentant heart. He loves it when people, in other words, are all in. 100%. All in. This is not a dummy run. We haven't got any rehearsal time. He's looking for people whose hearts are all in. And you check this out from Revelation 3 to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. In other words, God rather dislikes lukewarm faith. He wants people who are passionately all in for Jesus. Not, not building bankruptcy spiritually into their lives, but all in, not lukewarm, 100%. Giving it everything for Jesus. Making him known, opening our homes, being generous. Sacrificially giving. Loving people. Being joyful, giving the benefit of the doubt, living out the stuff we see in the Beatitudes, doing the stuff of Romans 12 that we looked at before. I, you know, the kind of opening homes and giving out uh, more honour to people than you might normally, etc., etc., etc. Beautiful verses in Romans 12. Look them up later. I think he truly loves it when people are all in. I think God despises tepid faith, actually. Now, I've often said this to people I work with. I'm not good at much, actually. I trade off the fact that I'm passionate. 
because on the 22nd of April 1990, Jesus met me. And though I did a lot of things wrong, I'm not the wisest bloke, I'm not the brightest bloke. I am passionate, annoyingly passionate sometimes. But I really believe it. I really believe it. I haven't got any rehearsal time. I really believe that God wants us to be all in, 100%. And when he sees that in a church, I think we build masses of heavenly treasure. I tell you what I really think will be my heavenly treasure chest one day. It'll be all those people, I, I pray to God, those people that I meet who, who came to faith because we had a go. That's your true treasure. Like that, all that stuff I've said, it culminates in, we will see people's lives transformed. One day we'll go home and there'll be all these people there who are saved, your family, your mates at work. Wouldn't it be amazing if you bump into a mate at work who has a right pain in the neck, then you meet him in heaven? And you have a conversation like, yeah, I know, I was horrible and I antagonised you and actually I was a bit of a what's it. But actually I, I looked at your life and I heard what you said and years later I met Jesus. Wouldn't that be amazing? You never know, dear. Every contact leaves a trace, you know. Lockhart's theory of forensic science, everything you touch leaves a trace that you were there. I think that happens spiritually too. But that's your treasure in heaven. Oh, God hates it when we look warm about this stuff. So if you want to empty your, your, your heavenly bank account, uh, your treasure chest, I, I think it's actually quite simple. Um, it, didn't take, it took me all the 30 seconds to come up with this. Don't share your faith. Uh, ignore poverty. Don't be generous and cultivate a spirit of meanness. For these are good ways to displease the Lord and to make sure you haven't got any cash in heaven. Uh, say unkind things and practice gossip. Be miserable and moany. It would definitely work if you want to pursue the alternative avenue, which I'm teaching you, so I, I, think we, I believe that we all should have a choice in these things. So I'm teaching you how to go about it the other way. Uh, be selfish and only do things that work best for you. That's a challenge in the church. Getting passionate about things that aren't just good for you. Having a view of the whole work. Um, stir up trouble is another one. Do you imagine if you only got half this podcast? They think, what terrible teaching is going on in this church? And, and um, the last one is, Believe you're the best at everything. How many times have I run into trouble with people who believe that they've got all the gifts? That they're the answer to everything and they know best about everything. The beautiful people that I meet are people who know they haven't got all the gifts. They don't believe they're the best at everything. And listen. And you know, share thoughts and ideas and don't get precious and protective. So don't share your faith. Ignore the poor. Be horrible, basically. Be unkind to everyone. Be miserable and moany. Be selfish. Stir up trouble. Believe you're the best at everything. And I don't think you'll have much treasure in heaven. If you live to please God, it may well be, actually, if we are truly sacrificial in our giving, in the way we live, in the way we live, you, you may not have a big bank account when you die. But maybe we shouldn't. I don't know. But a death benefit to be awesome. It's a challenge for us in the West. I know it has to, has to be a balance in there somewhere. But I think we should pursue the death benefits rather than the potential pension benefits. Um, there is a bit in here I just wanted to refer to to finish in Matthew 6, um, which talked about the eye, which I thought was worthy of not skipping over. I thought it was just quite important to mention uh, in passing here. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, I think this sits in the context here about money and serving money and material possessions and, and putting our focus on the wrong stuff, pursuing wealth. Um, which actually, all the research shows, if you do pursue wealth, you will be just a miserable person, actually, at the end of the day. The amount of lottery winners that end up in despair and divorce and 
heartache is unprecedented. And I think it's that coveting thing that takes us into the sort of ungenerous, ungodly lifestyle, actually. There are two cures or several cures for coveting. Coveting, looking at something else that someone has and you want it for yourself. One option is you just go and buy it. Then you don't covet it anymore. That's sort of a vague joke. Don't make notes on that. Like, if someone's got a Porsche and you covet it, if you buy one, then you're not going to covet it anymore, are you? That's a good point, isn't it? That's a bad point, yeah? Don't do that. That's a joke. There are some proper cures for coveting, which are, one. Bo- number one, wait. If you really want something, and it's getting inside your head, this happens to me, it's like, must have that thing, wait. See, if you wait a bit, you might find you actually don't want it anymore. Number two, avoid comparisons. In fact, this is important across a whole ream of living life. Do not look what other people have got, how beautiful they are, how they dress, what car they're driving, what house they're in. It will drive you absolutely bonkers. The best thing that you can do is thank God for what you have and seek to lead a humble, simple life before him, rejoicing in all that he has given you. Now, you don't tend to suffer from this if you're living in a poverty-stricken nation. But in the West, it's a bit of a curse upon us. It's just something that just gets inside your soul, really, when you start comparing yourself. It's just not worth doing. It will just destroy you. And I think if you are feeling the kind of coveting gene settling into you a little bit, uh, do something sacrificially generous. And not only will you lose the financial ability to cover and then buy the thing you wanted, but actually it will bless the Lord. And I, I, was, I was saying to Karen, actually, uh, yesterday, I, I, I feel challenged personally at the moment on these things. Um, when I first met Jesus, and probably for a good 10, 15 years, I, was, I, I, would, have, I would have paid to preach. You know, I, would have, I would have done whatever it took to get in front of people with the gospel. I would have lived anywhere in the world. Trust God with anything. 100%. And in my heart, I still feel that. But I don't always do that. If you know what I mean. And often when you preach, you find yourself, the Lord bringing you back. I thought, I don't want to lose this spirit of adventure and pioneering. And maybe that's a bit of a, a word for us as a church. In Isaiah 66, God lists two kinds of people. Um, to this one I will look, it says, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Then he lists a group of people he won't look at. But he who kills an ox is like one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like the one who breaks a dog's neck. He who burns incense is like the one who blesses an idol. They've chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abomination. So I'll choose their punishments and bring on them what they dread. And they're speaking of people who pursue idolatry and pursuing their own thing. But the people to whom God looks at, just these little verses in Isaiah 66, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and trembles at my word. I want to be that man. Like I said, I'm not good at a lot. And I get a lot of things wrong. But I, I, I pray that we all and myself, we'd be humble people, contrite, walking repentant before the Lord, trembling at his word. I don't, I don't want to be the other person. But the tentacles of that, they so easily get around us, don't they? Do you find that? Daily life, the tentacles of the other stuff so easily surround us. So let's you know, make it a thing that you pray about maybe this week. Show me what it means in my life to build treasure in heaven. Because as I often say, you are all going to die. You're all going to die. I've got a mate who's 49, 
cycled across South Africa with him. Fittest man I know for his age. He's amazing. We called him the commander on the ride. He was amazing. He's 49 years old. He's cycling over in Cheshire on Saturday. Has a heart attack. Heart stops. He's dead on the road for three minutes. For a consultant and anesthesiologist happened to come past and restart his heart. Cracked his skull. He's got bleeding on the brain. He's been in an induced coma. He's broken his back as well. Shattered his ribs. Restarted his heart. 49 years old. Loves Jesus. Loves Jesus. Just think, life is so fragile. We don't know the day that's appointed to us, but I do know this. I want to kneel before Jesus one day. When that moment happens, I'm like, come on, God. I gave it me best. I had a go. Got a lot wrong, but I had a go with what you gave me. Could we live in such a way that everything that God has placed in our hands we use for his glory and his purposes as best we can with the understanding that we currently have. I think if we could pray that we'd do that, this church would be explosive. And our workplaces would be transformed. Transformed. Such would be the presence of God with us. I really believe it. I really believe that.